This lesson is about bridge circuits or Wheatstone bridge circuits. I'd like to start with applications of bridge circuits because sometimes I find it more helpful to understand why you know a circuit's being used. Bridge circuits are used to find unknown resistance values. They're also used in sensors all the time. In fact, any transducer, which is just something that will convert one form of energy into another, say heat or light or pressure into electricity, if you can use a transducer to produce an electric current, then that can be hooked up to a bridge circuit to measure the amount of whatever effect you're trying to measure. So temperature sensors, pressure sensors like in a scale or a balance, a humidity sensor, carbon dioxide, oxygen levels, alcohol level, uh, pH level to measure the strengths of acids or bases, light level or intensity, all of these kinds of sensors can make use of bridge circuits to detect changes in their in their levels. So they're used all the time. So understanding how they work is a very helpful thing for people understanding electronics. Here's a schematic of a Wheatstone bridge. They were named after Sir Charles Wheatstone. He was a British a scientist and inventor of mid-1800s. He actually worked to help develop a type of telegraph system, but it became most famous for the Wheatstone bridge, although he didn't actually invent the circuit. But he he used it so extensively and, and developed it so much that it, it became known as the Wheatstone Bridge. It's simply four resistors hooked up in a diamond pattern with a output across the diamond. It's often drawn this way, but if we resketch it in that configuration, it hasn't changed the circuit at all. It just is a little easier to see the parallel relationships among the resistors, I think. So it easily shows that R1 and R2 are, are parallel with each other and R3 and R4 are parallel with each other. And the output is measured from A to B. Uh, here, say for example, we put a, a voltmeter at that output. We could measure the voltage across that bridge. If we put a voltmeter there, since R1 and R2 are parallel with each other, and R3 and R4 are parallel with each other, those in parallel to, with each other should have the same voltage drop if the resistor values are the same. So if I color code it like this to indicate the similar voltages, that would show that there should be no voltage difference across that voltmeter. We'd read zero volts. And that's what we call a balanced bridge circuit. In a balanced bridge, the ratio of resistances on one side of the bridge have to equal the ratio of the resistances on the other side of the bridge. So R1 relative to R3 has to equal R2 relative to R4. If that's the case, again, no voltage difference will exist across that bridge. We can rearrange that formula of ratios to find unknown resistance values. For example, let's say we did not know the value of resistor 1, but we did know the other three. Well, if we just took the ratio of R2 to R4 and multiplied it by R3, it would give us the value of R1. And we could do that for any resistor in this, in this bridge. Say, for example, we didn't know R1. We wanted to measure it we could hook up a potentiometer or a variable resistor instead of R3 being a fixed resistor. And what we would do is just adjust that variable resistor or potentiometer until we read zero volts on a voltmeter across the bridge. And at that point, then we can remove the potentiometer, measure the, the resistance between the two leads of the potentiometer, and that would tell us the value of R3. So then we could use that in a formula to calculate R1. So that's how bridge circuits are used to find unknown resistance values. And they're very, very sensitive and can be used to find very small resistance values. But what if the resistance values in the bridge are different? What if R1 and R2 are not equal, say? Or say, for example, R3 is much smaller than R4. So I've color-coded this to show that you could still have the same voltage drops on R1 and R2 if they're the same values. But if R3 and R4 are different, you're going to have different voltage drops across them. That's going to create a voltage difference between points A and B. And because the voltage is different, current is going to flow through that bridge. So if current starts to flow in our circuit, I'm using conventional flow here from positive to negative. Say current flows, it's going to go through R1 and R2. But once it gets to the node between R2 and R4, because R4 is such a high resistance compared to R3, it's a a harder pathway for current to flow through. So less current's going to flow through that resistor and more current's going to flow through the bridge and out through R3 before it returns to the source. So because of the voltage difference, current is going to flow across the bridge. And the greater the voltage difference, the more current flows across the bridge. And the direction of current flow is also determined by the polarity of the voltage difference. 
So what if we replaced one of those resistors or in the bridge with, say, a thermistor? Well, as temperature changes, the resistance of the thermistor would also change, causing a corresponding change in the current through the middle of the bridge. So we can use the, the voltage difference on that output uh, between the bridge or the current flowing through there to indicate the difference or the change in the resistance values. And that's really how any of those sensors work when using a Wheatstone bridge. You could use the same, say, for a photoresistor. As the, as the light level changes, it changes the resistance, and that's going to cause current to flow either one direction or the opposite direction through that bridge circuit. That's going to indicate the intensity of the light and how much that's changed. You can also use the same principle for strain gauges and balances or scales or accelerometers or all kinds of sensors. Let me go back to using an example of a balanced bridge circuit to find an unknown resistance. First, you'd build the bridge circuit using a potentiometer for the unknown resistor. You'd measure the voltage across the bridge. You could adjust the potentiometer until the voltage measures zero. Then you'd just remove the potentiometer and measure its resistance from the two leads that were connected in the circuit, and that's the value of the unknown resistance. Now, it's always good to compare your measured values to calculated values, just to double check to make sure you're not making any mistakes. So here's a picture of a Wheatstone bridge that could be used to find an unknown resistance. I've put a 10K potentiometer in, in the circuit, and I'll show how to measure that to determine the unknown resistance value. So I'm going to first measure the battery voltage here. It measures 10.2 volts. Then I'm going to attach that battery to the circuit. Okay. Now measure your voltage across the bridge from point A here and point B here. Notice it has a difference in voltage of 1.20 volts, actually negative 1.20. Uh, that's because of the direction the current is flowing. Then adjust your potentiometer until you can get zero volts. If you go too far, just back off. Okay, there's zero volts. Then remove one lead from the circuit so it's not powered. Switch to resistance and then measure the resistance of the potentiometer. This one's measuring 8.69 or 8.7 K ohms. 